Blessed be your name, O oh Lord. We enter into your gates with praise. We come to lift you up, Lord, and glorify your wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. No name, no name but your name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The only name whereby men can be saved. All power, all glory, all honor. <laughs> be unto the Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good.
music will be revived. If we don't get in too much of a hurry and we stay at your river shore, we're gonna come back thirsty. Some of you guys, we're just going to stay right here just a minute. You pastors have been here all week, just kind of get ready to get loose a little bit. Rejoice before the Lord, all his people. Rejoice before the Lord. Rejoice before the Lord. Rejoice before the Lord. They tell me John Starnes is here. <laughs> Where's he at, John? Are you here? Where are you at? Let me know you're here at least. Wave at me. Where? Get down here, boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't <laughs> I didn't know you was here, John. He's been hiding. Welcome, John Starnes. <laughs> I 
Apollo. <clears throat> he said he was up there trying to hide. You can't hide that light under a bushel. <laughs> I want John to come here and show us how to sing this song. Amen? How many of y'all have ever heard John Starnes sing? I hate people who sing high. And I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Look what the Lord has done. 
Seeing that a while ago, I was thinking about John Starnes, and one of the ushers walked up to me and said, John Starnes is here. I said, You lying? <laughs> <laughs> he said, No, he's up in the balcony. Hiding. Isn't that something? I said, Is there anything else you can do? He said, No, I'm just laying back up there. I'm waiting to get something. <laughs> well, hallelujah. I tell you what, we're going to let you be seated if that's possible. Praise the Lord. What a joy to tell you that the move of God is not only in the south, it's in the north. Yeah. Grand Rapids, Michigan is referred to as River City. <laughs> and uh, this revival has given River City a new concept. Some of you that are pastoring, and I know there are so many of you that are pastors here for the conference, might be under the impression, the mistaken notion that this river and this blessing, this revival, only comes to churches that are on some sort of a mountaintop, only comes to pastors that are in some kind of a spiritual high place. And I want to encourage you and tell you that that's not the way we discovered God's grace in this river. Because I was in a deep valley, one of the lowest valleys I've ever been in my life. Some struggles that I was experiencing. Our church had flattened out after 10 phenomenal years of growth. We'd gone from 250 to about 4,000 people. We built a new 5,000-seat sanctuary. We leveled off and stayed there. And I was dying, just feeling as though maybe God was trying to say something to me. Maybe my time in pastoring in Grand Rapids was coming to a conclusion. Maybe it was time that I passed the baton to someone else. But for 21 years, on a Tuesday morning, I've thrown my books in the back of the car, and I've gone about 40 miles out of the city into a little place in the woods, and I've sought God, and every Tuesday morning, every Tuesday morning, I pray for revival for our city, every Tuesday morning. In this time of the valley, I developed a vocal nodule on the right side of my throat, the right uh, vocal cord. The specialist looked at it, he saw it, and he was concerned because there was only one nodule that was very uh, obvious on one side, which means it wasn't the abrasive action that usually creates nodules. It means it could have been a cyst, it could be cancerous, whatever. He said, we're going to have to watch it. If it doesn't go away, we're going to have to operate. If, that, if we operate, that means that you won't be able to talk for a significant amount of time. So I urge you, Reverend Benson, he said, uh, I urge you not to preach. Uh, you should not sing, you should not whisper, you may only talk in a very soft conversational tone like this. Now you tell me how much passion a preacher can put in a message like that. I had not preached for four weeks when I woke up on a Saturday morning, sat bolt upright in the bed, looked at my wife and said, honey, we're going to Brownsville, we're coming to Pensacola. Something had happened that previous Wednesday night that I couldn't put my finger on, but I knew something of God's life was beginning to flow. And I knew that I needed to get here, and if there was any way that I could sit and talk to these two brothers for just a little while, well, I kind of figured that wouldn't be possible because uh, we hadn't made any arrangements to do this. I didn't figure there was any opportunity to, to really see them. And in any given service, there's a couple hundred pastors here looking for that opportunity. So I, I just said, we're going. I just know we're to be there. All hell fought us. All hell fought us from getting here, but we made it. Sat 
right there on a Sunday morning. I'd met Steve Hill before because Steve was a missionary in Argentina when I came to do the retreat for all of the missionaries in the Southern Cone Conference. I'd never met Pastor Kilpatrick, and I do know that Brother Kilpatrick, unless Steve said something to him, knew nothing about my vocal problem, my vocal cords. Sat over here in the service that Sunday morning, in the middle of the communion service, Brother Kilpatrick stopped. In fact, there were two interruptions, a divine interruption the first time when Steve interrupted the communion service to give an altar call. <laughs> Steve will give an altar call at the drop of a hat. <laughs> and about 150 people came and gave their life to Jesus Christ that morning. And I was just weeping, just weeping, watching. I love to see people get saved. It's my favorite thing in life. I live for that. And then Brother Kilpatrick came, and we were holding the emblems in our hand, getting ready to take the emblems. And Brother Kilpatrick said, I want Pastor Wayne Benson to come up here. God just said something to my heart. I had no idea what was going to happen. I came up here. He said, God told me, and I've never heard this expression in my life. He said, God told me to give you this bread, give you my bread for the healing of your body, for the healing of your vocal cords. And I exchanged bread with him, and we partook of the bread, and then he laid his hand on my throat, and this entire congregation lifted me up in the arms of prayer before God's throne. And I can honestly say that it wasn't the moment as much the moment of, of the sensation of a healing in my throat that overwhelmed me at that moment. It really wasn't that. I'll tell you what overwhelmed me. It was that God singled me out in my valley. God knew my address. And this whole congregation began to pray for me. That overwhelming sense of God's love. I want to jump ahead and tell you the end of that part of the story because I went back to the specialist that very week. I knew that week, I knew God had touched me because I had vocal strength again. And proper closure, I, I can, you can tell that in your voice. I went back to the specialist, he put that thing down my throat again, down through my nose and down into my throat, and he said, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. I sat back down in the service and just overwhelmed by the sense of God's love and God's presence. And at the conclusion of the service, people were being prayed for, and I was just swept up and raptured in the presence of God. I hadn't noticed that both John and Steve had left the platform, and an usher came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, Pastor uh, uh, John and Steve are in the office if you'd like to go in and talk with them. I thought that was so unusual. Yeah, I really would like to do that. And I went in because I had a thousand questions I wanted to ask. I sensed that the river was going to flow in Grand Rapids. Walked into the office, and they sat there just like it had been arranged for 3,000 years. And I asked every question that was in my heart. You will never know what that meant to me. You'll never know. I asked every, and they just sat there so patiently, just answering all the questions I had in my heart. Finally, when I got done asking my questions for about 45 minutes, people knocking on the door, finally, one of them said, I think it was Steve, do you want us to pray for you for this anointing? And I'm drooling all over the floor. And I said, yeah, I think I want you to pray for me for this anointing. And uh, what happened in the next few moments, I've been in Pentecost all of my life. I've seen some wonderful moves of God. But I've never experienced what happened in the next few moments. As they reached out to touch me, one of them anointed me with oil, and both of them laid hands upon me to pray for me.
And one of them, I think it was Steve, just doubled over and said, the anointing, and that's the last thing I remember on planet Earth. <laughs> now, let me tell you what happened. I want to say something. All my life, I have preached that God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the most misunderstood person of the Godhead, and the most misrepresented person of the Godhead, is always a gentleman. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if Ananias and Sapphira would agree with that assessment. That's what I've always said. But I want to tell you what happened to me. I had to ask my wife what happened because I literally felt the three of us swirling around that room in the vortex of a huge whirlpool. I mean overpowering whirlpool. I felt the vortex of a whirlpool, that river. And the next thing I knew, my hands were pinned to the floor and my feet my hands and my feet were pinned to the floor. No one has ever had an experience that they've articulated. It was anything like this. There was nothing back in my subconscious suggesting to me that I needed an experience like so-and-so had. But for the next 45 minutes, by the way, they left the office. They were gone. <laughs> they left. Kathy was out under the power of God on the other side of the couch, and I was out over here, and they just left. They were gone which, I, frankly, I appreciated. <laughs> because it gave me time just to be with God. In the intimacy of that room with my wife, I went through a crucifixion experience for the next 45 minutes. The very first thing that happened to me is I felt as though every bone in my body was being pulled apart. And I felt this incredible thirst, a thirst that I cannot explain. And I said, God, what is this? I don't understand. What is this? And the Lord said, don't worry, Wayne. I'm just crucifying more of your flesh. And I went through the stages of crucifixion. And in the last stage of crucifixion, and there are things that I could, I've never told anyone, I've not told my wife, there are things that God spoke to me in those moments that I have never told anyone. But there was a forgiveness, God forgive them for they know not what they do. There were things I'd had no idea that I needed to forgive anybody on planet earth. The last thing is I said, Lord, now I'm, I am pinned, I am pinned to the carpet. I said, Lord, I commend my ministry my reputation, my church, my pastorate, my authority, anything I am or ever hope to be, anything, I commend it into your spirit. And with that, I felt as though God released me off the floor, and I thought I was elevating. I thought I was lifting off the floor. It was a few minutes that went by. I did not know. when I was afraid to open my eyes. I thought if I opened up my eyes, I would be in heaven somewhere. I thought I'd be in a third, the third heaven. And when I opened up my eyes, it was honestly a relief to see the acoustical tile in the top of John's office. And I sat up, tingling in my hands that has not gone away, particularly as I have prayed for people in this revival. Different. Because this revival, it's not about falling down, it's not about shaking, it's not about uh, doubling over in laughter or doubling over in weeping, though every one of those things is happening in our church now. But I'll tell you this, it is about change. It is about change. Because change is the fabric of repentance, and repentance is what revival is all about. And you cannot have revival without repentance, and you cannot have repentance without change. I brought every one of our pastoral staff to this place, every one of them that week. We sat down on Saturday to, quote, evaluate the revival. While we were evaluating the revival, the power of God hid in that motel room. There were 11 of us sitting in that motel room. One of my pastoral staff came up to me, weeping and trembling, and he said, Pastor, I have anointing oil. Would you anoint, uh, would you anoint me and pray for me? 
This is a young man who's been associated with college ministry, very intense young man. As a matter of fact, he's so intense that when I hired him for the college and career ministry, I said to him, Tom, you've got to learn to lighten up. You've got to learn to at least laugh a little sometimes. Just, you just, you know, Chi Alpha, hard, you know, I mean, prophetic type. And I just said, you just got to learn to at least laugh a little bit. When I anointed them around that room, every single one of them fell out under the power of God all over that motel room. They were laying all over. And the last one was Tom. When I anointed him, he fell down on the dresser and then fell over with his head in the trash can, <laughs> which, which may have been symbolic. fell over with his head in the trap, laughing, laughing his head off. I've never seen anything like it, just laughing, double up. And when I saw him, I'm going to tell I have to be candid with you. I have never, ever spoken vocally one critical word of, of the phenomenon of laughter that we've heard so much about and so much has been made of it. I've never spoken one word against it, but in my heart, I've said to myself, now why on earth would we ever need that? But I'll tell you, Tom has been released in a new joy, and his ministry is different. And when I saw him, I about doubled over in laughter. I want to tell you something. It hit me, the joy of God and the strength of the Lord. Make a long story short, back home, I have pastored in Grand Rapids for 21 years. You have to understand the Grand Rapids culture. It is the heart of the Reformation in America. These are Dutch people. Dutch people. Very reserved, controlled, a little bit difficult to make things move. You don't sing southern choruses like, look what the Lord has done. You don't sing things like that in Grand Rapids. You don't sing things like that. I'm going to tell you, the power of God has hit so mightily in our church. Nothing is the same. We cannot have a deacon meeting. We open in prayer for a deacon meeting. Now, these are doctors and lawyers. The head of the cardiology department is one of my deacons and lawyers. And, and we just open the meeting in prayer. And the power of God hits, and all of us are down on the floor interceding for two and a half hours. Some of those brothers are under the table, under the boardroom table, speaking in tongues and interceding. I've given altar calls in the middle of the offering. No, I mean that. Twice in the mid. You've done that? I've never heard of that before, but it happened at our church. Two times in the middle of the offering, in the middle, the guy went to pray for the offering, and we gave an altar call, and people get saved. Change. I have never preached a message where people began to run to the altar in the middle of the sermon. I've never seen that before. But I have preached messages since this revival where the conviction of the Holy Ghost hits so hard that I get a third of the way through the message and people begin to run, not walk, but run to the altar, crying out to God for mercy, crying out to God for mercy, falling on their faces. Three weeks ago, I preached a message, and a third of the way through the message, they started running to the altar, started hitting that altar in repentance, confessing sin, I kept preaching. I kept preaching. I, got, I never got more than about two-thirds of the way through the message. When I finished, when I quit, two-thirds of the way through the message, there were easily 1,500 people at that altar crying out to God for repentance, backed all the way up in the gallery aisles, all the way up the center aisle, all the way to the back, all of them on their faces, crying out to God, seeking the face of God. It's real, folks. This is the real Thing. It's the real thing. He 
Healings are taking place that we like we've never seen before. We've always experienced good services. We've always experienced people coming to the Lord. But not 100 and 200 at a time. The first altar call I gave, there were 2,000 people that came to repent. The first altar call I gave when this thing started in our church. We've gone to Friday night services. Every Friday night now, we're, hold, we're conducting services for the purpose of giving altar calls and getting people saved. On any Friday night, any given Friday night, there will be at least 100 people saved on any given Friday night since this started six months ago now. But I wanted to tell you what happened with this young man in my church. Uh, not a young man. He's a middle-aged man in our congregation. He's had a serious epileptic condition for many, many years. It was 11.30 on a Sunday night. Uh, by the way, that's another change that has taken place. I used to receive letters when we would go more than two hours in a church service on a Sunday morning. I would get letters about once a month. You know, when you... Several thousand people can write a, a lot of letters, you know. And, and most of them are wonderful letters. But I would get complaints about once a month, Pastor, there's just no way that people should go two hours in a church service. It's not right. It's terrible for the children. Their little psyche will be damaged in the nursery. It's awful. You cannot put us two hours. How can you? Two hours of the presence of God is just too much. Nobody told me that the way God would solve that problem would be to go to four and five and six hour services. And since this happened, since this has happened, in six months, I have yet to receive one letter of complaint. Not one. Man jumped up in the aisle, in the mezzanine aisleway. It was about 11.30 on a Sunday night. There were still about 300 people at the altar praying and seeking the face of God and singing, worshiping. 11.30, we start at 5 o'clock on Sunday night. It was 11.30. All of a sudden, he jumped up in the mezzanine aisleway. By the way, people, it's not unusual to see 500 people dancing before the Lord. This is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> dancing before the Lord, our bodies strewn all through the aisleways at the end of our services. But this young man jumped up and said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And then he fell back down on the floor. And I thought, that's an unusual thing for Jim. I've known Jim for a long time. I've been there 21 years. I know these folks. And then all of a sudden, he got up and he started running around the church just fast as he could. And I, thought, I, I felt like it was of the Lord, but it was a little unusual. And... Uh, Jim that week had told me that he was scheduled to have brain surgery because his epileptic condition had gotten so bad that it was life-threatening. His life was out of control. It was not unusual for him to have as many as 10 seizures in a day. Jim's life was absolutely, he couldn't hold a job, he couldn't drive a car, he couldn't do any of the normal things that people would do. He said, I'm free, I'm free. Ran around that building. That week, he went to the doctor, and for the first time in 30 years of his life, he had a normal EEG. First time in 30 years. Free! Hallelujah. Praise God. I, I guess the way to sum up this revival... <laughs> Is, is to say it in the words of a prophetic utterance in which God himself described the revival. It went something like this. Thus saith the Lord, I myself have now come to fight the battle against the darkness. And your praise will ignite the praise of another people, and their praise will ignite the praise of another people, and their praise will ignite the praise of another people. And their praise will ignite the praise of another people. And their praise will ignite the praise of another people. And I say unto you, I have the enemy surrounded.
Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Woo. All right. We have just a couple more. We're going to try to make these as quickly as possible, but yet we know that God's doing some tremendous things in people's lives. We want you to get the gleanings while you're here of what God's doing. This man, I'm going to let him introduce him, himself and tell you who he's with, what special branch of the for armed forces he's with. And let's let him tell you what God's doing. Amen. Quickly is the operative word, I guess. Yeah. I'm used to being in control, but I'm having a hard time tonight, so you're going to have to bear with me. They had to scrape me up off the floor across the street to get me over here to come and testify. <laughs> I, I want to make this short but I, b I believe that God's going to speak to somebody, and I want you to hear. Twenty years ago, I was a young soldier serving in Germany, and I was addicted to heroin, and I was an alcoholic, and my life was a mess. And there was a revival that God sent to where I was in Bamberg, Germany, a revival. And in that revival, Jesus Christ reached down into my life and saved me and put his call upon my life. And a chaplain, was an, a, an, a chaplain that was stationed there at that time who was instrumental in bringing the revival, allowing the revival to take place, mentored me and loved me and, and discipled me. And it was during that time that God put his hand on my life and I'm gonna take you now down the road journey real quickly. Something happened over the years. I wasn't brought up in Pentecost, friends. I was brought up Lutheran. And there's a lot I don't know. I've been in the Assemblies of God since 1980. And I have to confess to you that I have not seen much that has affected my life like I've seen here. I'm just confessing to you, friends. I'm telling the truth in love. I am a chaplain with 1st Ranger Battalion in Hunter Army Airfield, Savannah, Georgia. I love soldiers. And sitting over here is a dear friend of mine, Pastor Jack Moon. I wanted to just stand up. I love him. Love him. Stand up, brother. <laughs> Friends, I'd been out there working for Jesus, doing the Lord's work on empty on empty. Do you hear me? On empty. And Pastor Jack said to me, he said, I was going to his church and I'm not home much. And that puts a strain on life in and of itself. I have four children and a wife. And he said, brother, you, you need to come with me to Macon, Georgia, because there's a pastor's conference and Pastor Kilpatrick's going to be there. I didn't want to go. I don't know why. Nothing against you, brother. I was busy doing the Lord's work, and I, I guess I had a lot of excuses. But I went. And in the morning session, Brother Robertson just spoke from his heart, and he, I don't know, he could probably say it better than I can, but he basically just stood there in front of us and from his heart just confessed of years of ministry and doing it in his own strength. And God was dealing with me. I didn't stand a chance. But I'm used to being in control. I'm a proud person. And in the service that evening, people were getting prayed for all around me and they were going down in, in droves, pastors. And there I stood and nothing was happening in my life. And I was struggling and I was struggling and I, and, and I, don't, I know that you instruct your people blessings. I don't know where this came from, and I'm not accusing any of your people, Pastor. But I heard a voice as audible as you hear mine right now, and it said, your stubbornness, that's all it said. Let it go. 
And I don't know if you remember, but I was standing all by myself. That's a lonely place. <laughs> and this dear man came over and just radiantly looked at me and stood and put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, God wants to bless you if you let him. And I broke. <sighs> all of that order in my life, all of that discipline just went running out. And here I am, this airborne ranger, we're supposed to be in charge of our faculties, we're supposed to be in total control. And I totally lost everything. <laughs> But in the process of losing everything, I gained so much more. You see, I'm still throwing the dirt on the grave of that person. I died that night. And I came to life again. I came to life again. God is moving. And in our, my brother's church, he was so gracious, and he said, you need to just come and tell the people. So I stood in front of the people. I hadn't had a chance to talk to my wife. You know, you just don't do that, you know, to your wife. She has no clue what's happening in my life. So I stood in front of the congregation, and I just confessed. And see, there's a lot I'm not telling you because the operative word is quickly. I'm trying to be a good soldier, sir. But when the Lord put me down, friends, he put me down. And he showed me what I was. But more importantly, he showed me what he wanted to make me. And when I stood in front of my wife and in front of my children, and in front of the people, and I just confessed openly and unashamedly, and I said, I'm, I'm not the man that I should be. I'm not the man that I should be. Forgive me. And friends, I'm, it's not, it's not, I've never slept with another man's wife. I've never done any of those, those things that you, you would consider despicable sins. But I was just on empty. And friends, that's a sinful place to be in. Pastor, I don't know who I'm speaking to, but there's somebody here tonight that's running on empty and you're stubborn, let it, go. Yeah, let it go. Let it go. And God will change your life. I stood in front of that congregation and I just poured out my soul. And before we could get any kind of semblance of order, which is now a way of life for us, <laughs> people just began to come forward. People just began to come forward. And this has been a, an ongoing thing at this church. It's just turned everything right side up. I went back to work. I went back to work, and I don't have time to even tell you all the things that we do. It's not important. But I went back to work, and you just don't go back like that and, and not affect somebody. And, and, and I began to invite people. We, did a, we, we, we prayed, and, and God told us, go to the Friday night service. I, I, Pastor Worry, I lost you. I concur. Yeah. <coughs> Dynamic. We went to that Friday night service, and I just began to invite rangers to come. I would just go up and say, come. And I'd give them an invitation to come. And they began to come. And God began to pour out His Spirit. And God began to save them. And I looked down on the floor, and here was rangers, a bunch of bald-headed fools for Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Friends, you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't, you don't put a ranger down. 
God puts a ranger down. Oh, friends, I'm telling you, when you see that, when you see people who are hard, people who kill for a living, people who take life for a living, and to see them prostrate before God, broken and needy, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. Friends, I brought my family just quickly. <laughs> I brought my family. You do, you, you're doing good, brother. It, it, uh, you're doing real good. <laughs> I brought my family here, and I want, I want my family to know Pentecost. At any cost, I want them to know what it is. And I brought my family here. I brought them to this place this summer. We, 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 we diverted our block leave to come here. And we went out and stood in that line to get in here. And Brother Hill preached a message, and the message was on forgiveness. Upon repentance and forgiveness, and, he, and we had to police up our chairs, and we had to move back there. And I have two teenage boys, and all my children, praise God, and are saved, but, they, but there was missing something very, very deeply missing in our lives. And we stood back there, and as part of the invitation, Brother Hill said, now I want you to look to the person that's standing next to you, and only if you're sincere and only if you mean it, and he brought out Acts chapter 5, and boy, it made me nervous. and said, don't bring that upon yourself. Speak the truth. And I'm standing next to my 14-year-old boy, and I'm going, oh, Jesus, you know, he's standing next to his father. This isn't going to work. <laughs> and behind me was my other son, and, behind, and, and, and next to him was my chaplain assistant. And as he was instructing us as to what we should do, before he could even complete his instructions as he was speaking to us, my son dropped, dropped down to his father's knees, just like this. He just dropped down here like this, and he grabbed hold of his, m my legs, and he squeezed with all of his might. And he looked up into my face, and he said, Daddy, I need forgiveness. And as if that wasn't enough, I looked behind me and my other son was on the floor. I'm, I, I don't know what's going to, I don't know where, I don't know where God is. Friends, I'm telling you, you talk about a river, it's a flood right now for me. <laughs> my son's are transformed. My family is transformed. We are not the same people. We are not the same people. And I praise God for it. Friends, I want to just encourage you. Don't be stubborn. Don't resist. Just yield. Just yield to him, and he will change your life. I am so deeply honored to be here. There's so much more that I could tell you. There's one last thing I want to tell you, and that is one of my rangers came, and we had a, we had a healing service, and he came on crutches, and he was baptized that night. And I, friends, I saw him get, get in the tank and his ankle was all contorted and his foot was swollen. I've seen ankle injuries before. And we had to help him into the baptismal tank. And God poured out his spirit on him in the tank. He was flopping like a fish. <laughs> and we had to help him get back up out of the tank. And then we gave op op opportunity to come and get in line for healing. And there was another chap in there 
Friends, God's pouring out His Spirit on chaplains. I see some of my brothers right here. And another chaplain was in the service, and he prayed for him, and they anointed him with oil, and they just prayed for him, and he began to move down the line. And he grabbed a hold of the chaplain, and he, and he said, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. I'm on fire. He goes, bro, what's wrong? He says, my foot's on fire. My foot's on fire. And he had his shoe. It was one of those ski shoes, and he had it loosely on his foot loosely. And he took it off, and, 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 the, and the, other, the flip side of all this is going on. This is kind of going on off to the side. I, I'm, I'm trying to preach a sermon. <laughs> and he took his shoe off, and right there in front of God and all of us, his foot was restored. Friends, he began to dance, he began to jump, he began to shout. He's ecstatic. And God's put his hand on his life, and he's accepted the call to go into the ministry. Friends, that's what's happening, too. That's the other side. I, I, it's, it's over. I'm done. <laughs> Friends, that's a, that's a sign of real revival. And if I'm here again, I'll tell you more. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come here a minute, brother. Hang on just a minute, brother. Hey. Hallelujah. Let's extend our hand toward him and pray. You know, friend, this, this right here is seeds. You see, what God started here in this church Hallelujah. on Father's Day of 95 was some seeds that he was planting in, in, um, in churches around the nation, around the world. But Holy Ghost has now invaded the armed forces. He's invaded the armed forces. And I want you to extend your hands this way. And Holy Spirit, I pray for Captain Soljum that the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon him. Bless him, Lord. Anoint him. Put fire in his mouth, fire in his eyes, fire in his hands. Anoint him, Lord, and use him mightily where you have planted him in your divine purposes. And, Father, let this fire now begin to burn like a raging wildfire in the armed forces of these United States government. Lord, invade Congress. Invade the U.S. House of Representatives, Lord. Invade the United States Senate, Holy Ghost. Lord, even more so, invade the White House. Move mightily, Lord. We have... One more quick testimony, quick testimony. I want you to hear this one. We've got to turn the service to Brother Hill. But he wanted you to hear this testimony before he preached tonight. You see, what God's doing is he's healing people. But see, no man gets the glory because no man's touching these people. It's just the Lord. And uh, during praise and worship, uh, without anybody even touching these people, they were receiving tremendous healings. And that's the way I like it. Let God get the glory. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. I want you to listen to this brother. Brother, make it quickly. (laughs) I like what this brother said on the floor here a while ago. He said, I'm through, but he still had the microphone, you know. He said, I'm through. (laughs) After after hearing all these, the guy don't know where to start, but I'll just say one thing. Uh, Our church group from uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, came down here. And um, I just got blessed. But in worship, 
First of all, um, I'm, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Um, uh, to, I'm 70% disabled. At the VA, um, at the hospital last surgery, at the last surgery, they lost my arm. It was like this. I used to call it the coffee cup arm, hand. That's all I could hold with it. I bought a new truck and I thought, I had to order it automatic, but I couldn't steer with this hand. I came here. Jeez. Oh, I came here, and uh, Steve, you start preaching. And there's things in our life are not right with God. And I lived for the Lord somewhat, about 99 point, you know, it varied. <laughs> My wife, we sat over there, she ran down the altar one night, the first night. And I says, I sat back there and I says, well, Lord, um, touch me too, you know. Um, there's some things that are not quite right, but I'll pray for them right here, and they'll be taken care of uh, the next night, and it was Thursday night. I ran down here. My hand was healed here, but the greatest healing there is, is when you surrender, when you kneel to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I want you as Lord. I'll tell you one thing, that's no makeup. I'll tell you one thing, I've been changed completely. Uh, I, and then I'm going to tell you a little about the healing. My hand was starting to get warm from my finger. And I said, wow, there's something wrong. And the finger's starting to get warm. And the hand start moving a little more. See, there's no muscle for this finger. This finger right here. If I put it this way, it would just stay there. Now I can move it. I'll tell you one thing, it's a strong hand, isn't it, brother? It is a strong hand. He's got a strong hand, too. He grabbed me a while ago. You, you, you army boys got strong hands. That thing, God healed it, brother. Yes. Uh, and I, I was called to preach, and I just rejoiced in the Lord for doing this, for making me free. So I was in business, and I'll just end it here. I was in business for years. I had a car rental agency. Uh, we sold about four to 500 cars a year. Been very successful, but the Lord broke me. The Air Force Base closed where I was at, and you know, when no business, guess what happens? You follow your wife. She worked on base. And I can tell you one thing. The Lord can get your attention. Now, I'll say one other thing. The Lord says, you know, if you don't listen to my word about your hand, I'm going to do something else to you. You know what it was? He says, I'm going to, uh, you're going to be going blind. And I tell you one thing. You start listening. Now, every once in a while I walked around and see how I felt blind. I said, wow, uh-uh. I said, and that's the reason why when I ran down to the altar, I listened to what the Lord had to say. God bless y'all. Amen. <laughs> God bless you. For... Yeah,
and I've had three microsurgeries. My right leg has not worked since 1992. I have not been able to go up on my toes. Let God be God. Hallelujah. God bless you. The guilty past bowed down with care. God gave a son to win. His every child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Hallelujah. Everyone pray with me. The same prayer, it's a simple prayer. We're simple people in touch with an awesome God. I want you to pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name. in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
I know everyone is here under divine appointment. I am certain of that. It makes no difference, friend, how you got here. If you hopped on a Boeing 757 and flew over from Thailand and you bought the ticket, you worked hard for the ticket, or somebody gave you the ticket, or you won the ticket somehow, it doesn't make any difference, friend. You are here under divine appointment. That means you're supposed to be here. We had one night that the police pulled up and they had arrested three young people. They were taking them to jail. But rather than take them to jail, they said, this, they don't need jail, let's take them to the revival. So they brought them to the revival. <laughs> I'll never forget that when they came up and said, the police are here. I said, oh, God, what's happened now? Because we've had stuff happen, friend. They said, no, they brought three kids. They're taking them to jail, and they wanted to bring them to the revival instead. So they marched these kids in here. I mean, you know, you go to church. Go directly to church. <laughs> the squad car pulled up outside and marched them in here. Two of them got saved that night. And they were here under divine appointment. They could say, well, no, no, the cops brought me here. No, friend, God brought you here. And maybe you're here tonight and your parents brought you here. And you are one of those kids, you're, a, you're just a plain snot. You're, you're a drag to be around. And one night some parents brought me their daughter and stood her in front of me right here. And she was the epitome of snothood. She looked at me, she hated me, had never met me in her life. But they told her that I was the evangelist preaching, so she knew that I was the one she should snot towards. And so she, she looked at me, she hated me, she just said, let me know what I'm talking about. Just that look on her face. And her parents brought her here, okay? Made her come to this revival. Friend, I wanna tell you, and I've had parents come and stick their rebellious kids in front of me at this revival, stand them right in front of me and say, Steve, this is Jimmy, save him. It doesn't matter how you got here, you are here under divine appointment. That means God ordained this time. Pastors that are visiting for this revival, you are here under divine appointment in this place right now. Well, I'm just here for the week. No, friend, every moment is ordained of the Lord. Every moment is ordained of the Lord. You gotta understand that. Another thing I know tonight, that's the first thing I know for sure, is everyone here is under divine appointment. The next thing I know is this message I'm sharing tonight is for you. It's not for Sister Sally. It's not for Brother Jim. It's for you. God knows how to prepare the heart for the message and the message for the heart. He has brought you here for this time to listen to the Word of God. I know that. Another thing I know, friend, is that many of you are going to respond. As a matter of fact, everyone's going to respond tonight. Those of you that are away from God, you will respond whether you realize it or not. If you don't come forward, you have responded. If God convicts you of sin in your heart, you have responded. If you don't come forward, if you walk out of this place and go off to some restaurant and sit in that restaurant under conviction, not having responded to the Holy Ghost, you have responded, friend. By not going forward, you said, God, I don't want you. That's a response. So everyone's going to respond, but many of you that are in the chapel, many of you in the cafeteria, in the choir room, and here in this main sanctuary are going to be hit by the arrows of the Lord. Let me tell you three things about his arrows. They're sharp, and this is a good word study, pastors. They're sharp, they strike like lightning, and they stick fast. How many have ever fallen under conviction? Try to shake it. It's impossible. It's the arrows of the Lord, friend. He's a bullseye artist. He knows right where you're at. As a matter of fact, we had a girl saved one night, and I was preaching on the arrows of the Lord that night, and she got saved, and she had a bullseye on her shirt. <laughs> you remember that? It was a literal bullseye. And I said, you were dead meat when you walked in this place, man. <laughs> I mean, it was just circles and circles all the way down to a little circle. I mean, God hit her heart. But his arrows are sharp. They strike like lightning. He will hit you suddenly, and they stick fast. And that means this, friends, his arrows are barbed. You can't pull them out if you tried to. They stick fast. The only one that can remove the arrow of the Lord is the Holy Ghost. And he does it in the surgery room, and that takes place down here. You can't sit, and I watch it night after night. I watch some people walk out of here with arrows sticking out of them. They try to go to sleep at night. You can't sleep with an arrow sticking out of you. 
They're under conviction and they're rolling over in the bed. They can't sleep. One lady, all night long, friend, she did not respond to the altar call. All night long she stayed home, tossed and turned in bed. Why? She was wounded. She had an arrow sticking out of her. She got up the next morning, called the church as soon as the office opened, and said, is it too late? I am most miserable. Can I get saved? Why? Friend, only the Holy Ghost can remove that arrow. Your friends can come around and say, it's okay, relax, don't worry about it. It ain't going to do it, friend. You need to respond. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Psalm 50. Charity, I want you to get ready to sing. I'm going to move quickly tonight. We have. Please, for those of you that are visiting for the first time in the other facilities and in this facility, we are time conscious, but it doesn't really matter. But what Pastor said a few minutes ago, I believe it was you, Pastor. What are you going to do? What's, where are you going? I mean, rush to do what? Get somewhere a few minutes early, an hour early. What's the point? I got to go to sleep. Why? So I can get up. What's that? You know? None of it makes sense, friend. So let God be God. Let the Lord touch your life. Say, when he's finished, he's finished. Then you'll know. You'll know, I can leave now. God's finished. But don't ever leave out going, I wonder if God had something for me. Don't do that. Psalm 50, verse 16. This is a, a message that uh, may be uh, quite hard for some of you in this room. I don't know. I don't believe there's hard and soft messages. I call them, there's, you know, you can liken some message to, to, to like Twinkies and Hostess snacking cakes and Little Debbie snacking cakes. And those are the love and the kindness and the joy. And, and then other messages are like Brussels sprouts, you know, and, and they're tougher to swallow, but we need them all. We need to hear about the wrath of God. We need to hear about the mercy of God. We need to hear the whole counsel of God, friend. So listen to the word of God tonight. Let him speak to you. Psalm 50, verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you hate discipline. First, let me, before going any further, some of you have already, have already done something that you should have never done. You have looked at this word, and when the word wicked came across, you automatically excommunicated yourself from this message. You automatically pardoned yourself. This isn't me. This is to the wicked. Friend, the heart is deceitfully wicked. I can prove to you that this is for everybody in this room every single soul in this room. How many here have done something before that you wish that you hadn't done? How many have said something suddenly one time and wish you had never said it? You know what that is, Christian? That's your wicked heart. That is your wicked, wicked heart. How many of us in this room, if I would have some type of powers to magnify on that wall, every thought that went through your mind over the last 24 hours, every lustful thought, every envious thought, every critical thought, if it was thrown on that wall, it went through your mind and you know it did. Some of you even entertained it. But you got a badge on. You're, you're known as a holy person. If I could project on that wall that thought and sign your name to it, you'd crawl out of this place. See, that's who we are. That's it. not what people see, friend. God sees the heart. So when I say a scripture like this, to the wicked, it's not just the people that are so bad and God-haters. It's the transgressors, those who have sin in their hearts. Stay with me for just a minute here. Verse 70, 17, for you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you associate with adulterers. 
You let your mouth loose in evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. I want to preach just for a few minutes on the silence of God. The silence of God, friend. Stay with me for a few minutes because everyone here needs to hear this. There's many people in this room, you are experiencing dead silence right now. As a matter of fact, Doug, are you around? You got that tape? I want you to do this, Doug. I wasn't going to use this tonight, but I'm going to go ahead. For some of you, this is what this revival is, around, uh, is about. This is how you come in. You come in. Your life is full of noise. It's full of activity. And this is how it sounds when you come to this revival. I want you to play this. Oh, so busy. There's people in your life. There's activity in your life. There's church board meetings in your life. There's restaurants to go to. There's PTA meetings to go to. There's family fellowship to go to. Your life is constantly swirling around you, busy, working, making money, spending money, doing what you do best. Cut that. That's where you're like. But what happens in this revival, friend? Something happens when people walk in here. They're arrested, and they sit under the Word of God, and they realize that God has no place. He's not anywhere around, and what they hear is spooky. Thank you, God. I thought you were with me. I thought you were in my life, God. Aren't you blessing my family? Isn't that your blessing on my family? Isn't that your blessing on my ministry? Isn't that your blessing, Father, on my business? Where are you? No voice. And people come in here night after night, friend, and they realize that he's not there. He's not there. They thought he was there, but he's not there. And many of you within the sound of my voice could testify tonight, you thought he was there, but you don't know him. You don't sense his presence. And you come into this revival and after all the activities of the day, after all some of you, after years and years of running to and fro, buying and selling and getting gain and doing this and doing that and attending churches, that's all part of your life. It's like you got Jesus and God in your hip pocket. You come into this revival and you are arrested and one of the first things you hear is nothing. He's not with me. The silence of God. Verse 21. As a matter of fact, I want to turn to one more scripture. Ecclesiastes, turn over there with me. There's some stuff in this word, pastors. We better start preaching it. You hearing me? We better start preaching it. I did an interview just a few minutes ago with some friends from Finland. God bless you folks from Finland. But I told them, my whole family's from Finland. And we talked a little bit about the difference between the love of God and the wrath of God and the fact that here at this revival we speak a lot about the judgment, a lot about wrath. And if you've been in these revival meetings, you know I've preached on the love of God over and over again. I preached on the peace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. We've had messages, friend, where God just embraced us, loved on us, cared on us. But a lot of the messages, friend, have to do with you've had about all the chances you get if there's ever been a nation on the face of this earth that deserves judgment, it's America. 
We've heard it all. We have visitors from around the world here tonight. They would give anything to have what we have. Flip on a TV set and watch channel after channel after channel of preaching on the gospel. Get tired of that? Flip on the radio. Take your pick, AM or FM. Three preachers are on one side and down the other. You don't like that? Well, why don't you just turn on contemporary Christian television and watch just plain old Christian concerts all day long. We got that too. You don't like that? Head on down to the Christian bookstore. Get anything under God's sun, anything you want. It's all for sale. You don't think we're going to be held accountable, friend? You're wrong. Verse 21, that's the first of all, Ecclesiastes 8, I'm sorry. Verse 8, chapter 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times, and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. Verse 11, don't let this slip by you. It's not late, by the way, friend. It's early. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. You know what that's saying? It's because, because God has not moved in and brought down punishment. People think everything's okay. Everything is not okay, friend. Now back to Psalm 50, verse 21. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. This has got to be, these scriptures have got to be some of the toughest to swallow in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, this morning as I was working on this message, I've touched on the silence of God in this revival, and God keeps adding to this. I began digging deeper this morning, and I pulled out 25 translations of the Word of God trying to find some people, somebody that would reprove and 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 take this scripture and make it say what it doesn't say, make it say something different. And I went after translation after translation and commentary after commentary, and I couldn't find anybody that said anything but this, that God will reprove you and God will tear you to pieces. Friend, I looked up, this is Spurl's translation that uh, Leonard Ravenhill gave me for Christmas of 1992. This is from the original Hebrew. Mike, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. It's a wonderful translation of the word straight from the Hebrew. I looked that up, and it scared me half to death as I read straight from the Hebrew what God was saying about his silence. And I want you to understand something, friend. We're going we're gonna to know without a shadow of a doubt what is going on when God is silent. How many want to know? There are many here tonight that are questioning the very existence of God. Because of his apparent absence in your life, you are beginning to wonder if he even exists. You haven't felt his presence. You seem to be in control of your own destiny. You can't see his hand in your affairs. If he's out there, he's being awfully quiet. He's being silent. At times, you feel like a ship on a vast ocean, left alone to battle the raging sea. Perhaps you can remember a time in your life when you heard the voice of God, you followed his commands, you lived under his authority, you listened to his instructions, but for some reason, you have drifted away, and now you can't seem to decipher his voice. Your life is like a radio that's not tuned into just one station. You ever done that? You're between several stations, and what do you get? Just static everywhere. You can't make out a song. You can't make out voices. It's just static. Many of you are like that tonight. Right now, my friend, I could speak to hundreds in this room, and I am, that are experiencing the silence of God. There's so much to be said on this subject. You could spend an entire pastor's conference on it. I want to say something to those of you that are on fire for God before going any further. Some of you have been praying for a long time. You're on fire for God and you're asking God to move, but he's been silent. 
He's been, he hasn't moved. You've heard the old adage that says his delays are not necessarily his denials. Some of you where you haven't felt God for months, I've been like that, I've ministered for months where I did not feel the presence of God. How many know what I'm talking about? You did not feel the presence of God. I've been like that and I would hold campaigns and plant churches and everyone around me would be blessed and I would go home as empty as I came. And I didn't feel the presence of God. I'd go, God, where are you? And I wasn't in sin. He was just silent. And I would take hope, and I want you to find hope, friend, tonight in Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always. Christians, look at me. I'm just going to park and move on quickly on this. The Bible says, and you can't deny the Bible says, the Bible says it whether you believe it or not, that makes no difference. The Bible says it, and that settles it. Lo, I am with you always. So if you are a Christian and you love God and you don't sense his presence and you're not living in sin, he is with you. Did you hear me in the chapel? Dick Rubin, are they listening over there? He is with you. He is with you. He is with you. Regardless of what you feel, he's with you. Now, for everybody else, when God is not making noise in your life, when he is not making noise in your life, some of you, friend, could be in incredible, dangerous waters. I want to tell you what his silence doesn't mean. What his silence doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God is thinking like you. Unsaved person, drug addict, backslider, when God is quiet, it doesn't mean he's thinking like you. The Bible says that the wicked were saying, because God is silent, because he's not doing anything, then he must be thinking like us. Be careful. God is not thinking like you. He never has and never will. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. They're much higher. They're much deeper, friend. He's not thinking like you. Just because God is silent doesn't mean he's conformed to your way of thinking. Here in the sanctuary, many of you have fallen for this lie. Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes just a minute ago. I read that. Because a sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly. I'm going to go ahead and this is going to hurt. Some of you are harboring sins from years ago. You did something 10 years ago and you've covered it up for years. You know you did it. God knows you did it. And maybe a couple other people know you did it. Maybe no one knows. Solomon would say this to you tonight at this revival meeting, just because his sentence was not executed quickly does not mean he was not watching. He's going to bring it out tonight, friend. I tell you, once again, what I'm concerned about, I'm concerned for America. I want to see the America, I want America to experience true, authentic Christianity. I want America to, to, to meet a Christian. I want America to meet someone who is on fire for God and as pure as white snow. I want America to meet people that their shadow heals the sick. I want America to meet people that had the anointing of the Holy Ghost all over them. I want you, sister, to go to the mall, go to the food court at the mall, and while you're ordering a hamburger across the counter, I want you to be able to say, ma'am, I discern in my spirit that you're not right with God, and I want her to hit the pavement under the power of God and then I want everyone else in the area if you don't think this can happen you have a small God and then as she hits the, pa the pavement under the power of God I want you to flip around and say to the people what are you looking at and begin naming out 
problems and family problems and sin. And I'm talking about everybody wants a word for Christians. Nobody wants a word for heathen. I got a word for you, brother. That's easy, friend. That's a piece of cake around the men's bathroom. You know, got a word for you, brother. Why don't you go to Walmart? Have a word for someone at the, you know, the food counter. Why don't you go get your tires fixed and have a word for the mechanic that's cussing up a storm? Why don't you have a word for them? Jesus is, see, that's the kind of word he had. He went, the Samaritan woman, got a word for you, lady. Everybody wants a word for Christians. But I want America to experience true, authentic Christianity, friend. And that's why we have to deal with some of those things that you think God has been silent towards. No, sir. Wrong. He hasn't. He's doing something. You're going to learn tonight what he's doing. You think he's thinking like you. You want to know how men think, friend? This is how they think. Those of you that are looking for points to a message, there's only two points. What, he does, what his silence doesn't mean and what his silence does mean. And I'm covering what it doesn't mean right now. It doesn't mean he's thinking like you. How do men think? One of the things we do, friends, we're incredible actors. We are masters at hiding our sins from one another. Therefore, they think they have succeeded at hiding them from God. God doesn't think like you. Just because you can put on a charade with your brother or sister in church, just because you can put on a mask at work and hide yourself in front of those folks doesn't mean you've done piddly with God. He sees everything you've done. He knows your beginning from your end. He knows it all. Read the psalm and you'll see a group of people who were all wrapped up in ritualistic religious exercises. They were cloaked in religious garb, acting out their parts. They would win an Oscar for their performance, but God hasn't even seen the movie. He's not thinking like men. He hasn't come to watch you perform. So what if you're arrayed in white and the world marvels at your appearance when you inside you are full of dead men's bones? This is how men think. We think he's thinking like us. No, sir. Friend, you haven't hid anything from God. He doesn't think like you. Someone can walk up to you and pat you on the back, offering words of adoration and praise. Boy, Billy, you sure are a great example to me. Friend, you can be judged as holy by the sons of men and still be judged a heathen by the Son of God. You can sing about heaven and still go to hell. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can be praised for involvement in the work of God and spend eternity in the pits of hell. Remember, men can hide their sins from one another. So often they think they're hiding them from God. I could go on and on, friend. Pastors, how many of you have had a member of your church that you've wondered about? You know, you know what I'm talking about. They've been in your church a long time, but you wonder about them. I'm going to tell you, Pastor, your wondering is probably totally correct. Because, see, Christians, true Christians, are as transparent as crystal. They're as pure as can be. You can take a pure Christian, walk right over to the house, come on in. You can pull open any drawer in the whole house. Open the refrigerator by surprise. Just open it up. True Christians will let you go anywhere. They'll look between, let you look between the mattresses. You ain't going to find no Playboys. You ain't going to find no penthouse. That's true Christianity. That's true Christianity, friend. But how many pastors, they've come up to you and said, Pastor Daniel, what an awesome message. You're my kind of preacher. Even the altars could be full. People could be saved, but that doesn't mean he has conformed to your way of thinking. Friend, stay with me just for a minute. I ain't going to rush. There's no way. It's too, it's too, it's too important. Everybody's going to get prayed for. Cloudy's going to pray for everybody, anyhow. Claudia Frayson's going to pray for everybody tonight. And I want to tell you, down in Buenos Aires, he does that. He, he would pray for stadiums of people all at once. <laughs> but I told him here, none of that. Here I want him to lay hands individually on every single one. How do men 
think. I'm telling you, he's not thinking like you, friend. Listen in the chapel. There's a man in the chapel right now, Dick Rubin. He is squirming in his seat. You are squirming. Why? Because something has just surfaced. And you're doing everything you can to squelch it. Put it back down. It ain't going down. I'm going to tell you, friend, that's God having that sin rise to the surface. The Holy Ghost is doing that. He's causing you, friend, to come alive in Jesus, and he's going to cause you right now to feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to convict you of sin. Men, how do they think? Men tend to be very lenient towards themselves. We're great actors. That's one of the ways we think. We think no one knows. God knows. Another thing, friend, about the silence of God is we are very lenient towards ourselves. This is how we think. When it comes to punishment, we're very kind to one another. We forgive. Look at the president we just put into office. I'm going to tell you honestly, in America, it just doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if somebody stands up and says, I am a murderer. I am a rapist. Just a few years ago in America, one of our politicians tried to rise to office and he was caught with a woman sitting on his lap, you remember it, and he lost everything. No one would even look at him again because he had betrayed his family. One photo of a woman sitting on his lap. That was not too long ago. Now look at us. We're in pitiful shape, friend. But we are very lenient towards one another, friend, and it's getting worse. I've heard so many people say, God would never send a man to hell. Why would you say that? Because you are very lenient when it comes to punishment. You just couldn't imagine something like eternal damnation, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Think about the nation we live in, friend. Where else can a rapist spend a few years behind bars and then get let loose? Where else could a hardened criminal walk into court decked out in a slick suit, a silk tie, and brand new shoes, snowball the jury, and get probation when he actually deserves life in the penitentiary? Where else in the world but America? Where in other countries of the world, if you're committing crimes, if you rape another person, if you steal somebody's pocketbook, they lay your hand on a block of wood and chop it off. Chop it off. You what? You raped my daughter? Hang him up. Kangaroo court. Guilty. But not here, friend. We are so lenient. And what that has done, it, it has invaded our theology to where now we think God is lenient towards us. Wrong, 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 wrong. He is not lenient towards us. God is not like you. He's not thinking like you. How many people have said to me, well, God understands. When I die, he'll take care of me. How many parents have said that to me about their kids? God knows, Joey. He's a good kid. He's a righteous judge. How many of y'all heard that? How many have said that? He's a righteous judge. Maybe Billy made it to heaven. Hogwash, friend. Billy lived in sin all his life. He died 100 miles an hour, hit, a tr hit another truck, drunken out of his mind. He, hit, he went into eternity in an instant. You're saying, well, God's a righteous judge. You are guilty of what I'm talking about, friend, thinking that God is thinking like you. Parents come up to me when they want me to perform, to, to officiate a funeral. And the kid I know is hell-bent, has gone to hell. I knew his life, and they beg of me to talk nice about him. And I go, sister, please, let me share the truth with these people because all his friends are coming. This place is going to be full of high school kids that are away from God. They knew your son. They knew your son. Let me talk to them about Jesus and the wrath to come. Let me talk to them about hell for a few minutes. Let me talk to them about judgment. Well, I just don't want to make a scene, Brother Hill. I want to tell you, if Billy was alive, he'd make a scene. If Billy could come back and talk for 30 seconds, the whole place would be at the altars. 
but we think he's thinking like us. It's the truth, Pastor. We're so lenient, friend. We wink at sin. That's one of the things that his silence doesn't mean. It doesn't mean he's thinking like us. Another thing that it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean he's not watching everything you do. His silence does not mean he's not watching everything you do. He may not be speaking, but his eyes are watching everything you do. Silence does not mean absence of activity. I've preached a message in this place entitled God's legal system out of Daniel chapter 5. You know the story when the judgment fell on Belshazzar. Thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting during a hilarious party, during the, the, the fiesta when everything seemed to be wonderful. The party was in full speed. God comes down in the writing on the wall. I have been watching. But I haven't felt you, God. I've been here and I've been watching. Everything you do, everywhere you go, everything you say, friend, if you want to do a word study, you do a word study on what we're going to be judged for. Every idle word, does it say it, Michael? Every idle word that comes out of our mouth. There are books being written, friend, that should scare us to death. I'm going to close in just a minute. God has been watching your every move. He is keeping a record of your actions. We love the scriptures that say every hair of our head is numbered, but we cringe at hearing Revelation 20 where it talks about the books that were opened, talks about how men were judged for the things written in the book. We love the one about the hairs of our head. I've heard that praise so many times. God understands, sister. He knows every hair on your head. He watches the sparrows as they fall. Oh. He watches your sin too, bub. Everything you do, he watches it. He sees it. It doesn't mean that God is thinking like us, friend. Friend, maybe the reason God's not talking to you is because he's too busy writing. I don't know about you, but I'd rather God put down his pencil and start to talk to me for a few minutes. God, I want to hear you. Break your silence, heaven. I'm tired of the holy hush. I want heaven to speak to me. I remember standing in a courtroom and I had snowballed the, my lawyer. You can close your Bibles. I had snowballed the lawyer. I had one of the top attorneys in northern Alabama. He was a Perry Mason of the area. Paid him a lot of money. I was, going, I was going under for sales of narcotics. But I only told him half the story. You know? Just told him enough to get me off. And he always told me, Pastor, he said, Steve, tell me the whole truth. Even if you're guilty, tell me the whole truth. I want to know the whole truth, Steve. I can't represent you if you don't tell me the whole truth. But I didn't. I held back. And I remember walking into the courtroom, and this is such, such a, a perfect, to me, a perfect illustration of how God's courtroom will be. We just don't think everything's being written down. Why? We're thinking like we think. He's thinking like he thinks. And it's two different things, friend. I walked into the courtroom, and they said, the state of Alabama versus Stephen L. Hill. Proud, a suit on, I cut my hair. Greatest lawyer in town. Well-known, plays golf with the judge. I'm home free. We stand before the judge. They read the sentence to me. They read the, 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 the court report to me. State of Alabama versus Stephen Hill for sales of this, the, uh, narcotics, sales of LSD. And the, the judge says, how do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. To the lawyer, how, how does he plead? Not guilty. We stand back. 
in comes a prosecuting attorney with a stack of papers. He stands before, this was an arraignment, he stands before the judge and opens this notebook with all these papers in it. And he says, Your Honor, the state of Alabama versus Stephen L. Hill, this is our case. On October 21st, 1972, Steve Hill left his house at 6 a.m. in a blue pickup truck. He drove three miles to Bruno's parking lot and waited patiently for a black van with two occupants. At exactly 6.32, Steve stepped out of that van, and as they were saying these things, my heart was doing this. My palms began to sweat. And he began to read my life story. Said Steve had on that moment Adidas tennis shoes, a white t-shirt, and Levi blue jeans. The man in the van was wearing a red t-shirt, had white shorts on, gave every minute detail, went through all the people up to the point where I sold the drugs to the narcotic agent. Everything that happened, friend. And as I was listening to that, I walked into that courtroom, a free man. Halfway through it, friend, I was as guilty as guilty can be. I turned to my lawyer. My lawyer turned to me and said, what are they talking about, Steve? And I said, we got to talk. And he went up to the judge and he said, Your Honor, we need a postponement. And I'll never forget their conversation in that office. He looked at me and says, you want me to represent you. Don't you ever make a fool out of me. Don't bring me into that courtroom half equipped to represent you. If you're guilty, you're guilty. I want to know every detail. Don't let me stand anymore in front of those prosecuting attorneys. I am one of the top lawyers in the city, but I've got to know what you've done. And I'm telling you, friend, tonight, God knows everything you've done, and Jesus Christ is the only lawyer that can help you out, and you better pour every last detail out to him. He needs to know it all. Don't sit in this place tonight and harbor some little sin and not turn it over to Jesus. And on that final day, you just did some blanket washing in the blood. And on that final day, you stand before God and you were guilty of adultery 16 years ago, but you never took care of it because God was silent. I'm going to close. Slowly. <laughs> what is silence does mean? It does mean, friend, that he's patient. These, you can just write these down. It does mean that he's patient. How many thank God for the patience of God? It does mean that he's patient. The prodigal son's father, you notice when the son left, this is in Luke 15, you know the story. His father didn't come running after him. Have you ever noticed that, pastors? His father let him go. That means his father was patient. Let the kid run his course. God is patient. God also knows, friend, with, the, with his silence, he knows the natural effects of sin. He knows where it's going to take you. He knows what the adultery is going to do to the family. He knows what it's going to take for you to come to your senses. And sometimes he just stays his hand silent and lets you go all the way to the pigsty. Doesn't send a servant after you, doesn't come running. It also means, friend, not only that he's patient, but he is long-suffering. He can endure the pain of your rejection far longer than most of us can endure such treatment. And the last thing tonight, friend, I've got through halfway through my notes. The last thing that his silence does mean, and you listen to this, friend, and you park on it and don't let, this, don't let the devil steal this from you tonight. What his silence does mean is he is working out his plan. I will reprove thee. The Bible doesn't say, I am considering reproving thee, or I might reprove thee, or I might do something about it. The Bible says, I will reprove you. That means I'm coming after you. 
and set them in order before your eyes. Now, military men, that was a beautiful testimony, brother. This is a military phrase right here. To set them in order before your eyes has to do with an army, military lineup. He's saying, what he is saying is, while God is silent, while I am silent, and you're involved in your sin, I am lining up your transgressions against you like an army. And one day, they're going to come marching towards you. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been invaded by the sins of the past. They've all come like an avalanche towards you. I will set them against you. Friend, you might have forgotten God and your obligation to him, but he hasn't forgotten you and your rebellion towards him. He will reprove you, and according to verse 22, he will remove you. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Consideration is the first step towards conversion. Lest I tear you to pieces. You want to know what I, I hate about modern theology, friend? Nobody wants to talk about stuff like this. I hate it. Mike talked about the wrath of God today. Nobody wants to talk about the wrath of God. Friend, it's in there. It is in there, and every one of us is going to stand before God one day, and I want to make sure every one of us heard about it, that God's wrath is real, and he is storing it up. Matthew Henry, that's one of the reasons I love the old books in my library, because I didn't whitewash nothing. I just purchased from a friend in Atlanta, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It is this thick. I have the 1684 edition. Each book is three volumes, this thick, fine print. This thick, friend, it's this tall, this wide, and each book is this thick. It's this thick on my shelf, huge. Go to the Christian bookstore and buy Fox's Book of Martyrs today. That thick, this tall, that condensed, friend. Fox covered that in the preface. I love the old writers because they took time and wrote about the way it really was. The original Fox's Book of Martyrs, and I'll bring it in here one day, there's pictures of people and how they were tortured, of the spears going in, of the rocks busting their heads wide open, about one carriage on one side and another carriage on the other side, and the lady's got her feet tied up down here and her neck tied up, and they're ripping her apart with their little children standing by watching, saying, if you will confess... Just, just deny Christ, we'll let you go. The little kids watch mommy's head pop off, and then they're next. And the daddy watches it all, all this whole family die, and then they kill him next. That's why I love some of the old writers. They told it like it really was. But boy, you get these abridged, 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 abridged. By the time you get to 1996, there's nothing left but pablum. There's nothing left but fluff. Matthew Henry said, those who do not consider the warnings of God's word will certainly be torn in pieces by the execution of his wrath. When God comes to tear sinners in pieces, there is no delivering them out of his hand. They cannot deliver themselves, nor can any friend they have in this world deliver them. Oh, that's what he meant. That's what it says. That's what it says, friend. Everyone stand. Those of you with the chairs, I want you to move them to the left and the right. If you would, please do it quietly. Brother Steve, I came to hear an uplifting message. You just did, friend. The wrath of God. By the way, friend, while they're moving those chairs, let me tell you how far we've slipped in this nation. This right here is Webster's Dictionary, 1845. This is not an abridged dictionary. This is Webster's Dictionary from 1845. I was just flipping through it today, and I thought I'd look up a couple words. And um, 
Let's just look at the word wrath. I wonder what Webster said about wrath. I know what they say in today's dictionary, but what does Webster say? He says violent anger, vehement exasperation, indignation. Then he says this, the effects of anger, Proverbs chapter 27, the just punishment of an offense or a crime, Romans chapter 13, God's wrath is holy and just indignation against sin, Romans chapter 1. That's Webster. You look, look up the word walk, just walk, you know, one foot in front of the other, walk. You look up Webster, he says, to walk in the spirit, to walk after God, to walk in the flesh. It's all scripture all the way through the whole thing, friend. And this is not a reproduction, this is it. This is an old, old dictionary that they used to read in our schools. Johnny read wrath, Johnny reads wrath. Every one of the definitions has a scripture next to it. What has happened to our nation, friend? Noah Webster would roll over in his grave reading the 1996 Webster Dictionary. They need to take his name off of that. Miriam, let it be Miriam's Dictionary, not Miriam Webster. He didn't have anything to do with it. He was a godly man. Let me tell you something tonight, friend. I'm going to have Charity come and sing in just a second. Charlie, give me some water, brother. Some of you in God's silence, look this way. Don't let any of these chairs distract you. Friend, I want to tell you, distraction will rob you of what God has for you. God is going to move in many of your lives right now, but I want to tell you what happens. When you're not hearing the voice of God, oftentimes you're hearing other voices. When you're not hearing God's voice, he doesn't seem to be doing anything in your life. Satan knows that. Oftentimes, he's the one that's causing all the noise around you. And right now, when I give this altar call, many of you are going to hear Satan's voice clearly. And he's going to tell you, don't come down to that altar. There's no need to repent. God's not going to get you for what you did years ago. God's not going to do anything to you for what you've done recently. God's not that way. Friend, who do you think is talking to you? I wrote some lullabies. And I want you to listen, friend, because this is some of you. You're going to hear this right before Charity sings. You're going to hear these lullabies. And this is Lucifer speaking to your heart. The silence of God. He's nowhere around. And Satan is saying to you, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about a thing. God loves you. He cares about you. You were baptized as an infant. It's okay. Listen, you go to Sunday school. Come on, you're a pastor. You don't need to respond. Go to sleep and good night for your soul not to worry. There is time, rest assured, you will make it right someday. But for now, just relax, put your conscience at ease, tell your heart it's okay, there's no urgency, please believe. There, 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 just relax. You don't need to respond. God loves you. He's not going to be upset at what you've done. He's a God of love. God is love. He will forgive you. Jesus died for you. He forgives you. You don't need to confess. Hush, little sinner, don't you cry. Satan's going to bless you before you die. The world I'll lay before your feet. Don't be concerned for the judgment seat. Hush, little sinner, don't you cry. Satan's going to tell you the reason why. I'll give you fortune, wealth, and fame. From this point on, you won't be the same. My plan's for you. There's so much to share. Trust in me. You won't have a care. If all these things can't satisfy, I'll give you more. 
before you die. Your heart is pounding hard, it seems. Don't turn to God, it's all a dream. Rest in my arms, we'll sing a song. Together we will walk along. The hush of God should be no concern. Just trust in me, of this I've learned. He threw me down from my lofty place. And now I convince all the human race that God is pleased with your life down here. He's not going to harm all his children dear. He's kind, he loves, he will never do what the Bible says. It's just not true. So hush, little sinner, don't you cry. Satan's going to bless you before you die. The world I'll lay before your feet. Don't be concerned for the judgment seat. There, there, just go to sleep. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Just relax. Just relax. In the name of Jesus. Lucifer, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You have no place in this room. You have no place in the chapel. You have no place in the cafeteria. You have no place in the choir room. And you certainly have no stronghold in this room here. Here's what you're going to have to do, friend. God has been silent. God has held back. But the wrath waters are rising, friend. And there's coming a day where the dam that is being held back by the hand of God, he will lace, he will loose his hands from that dam. It will bust wide open and the waters of wrath will rush over your soul and you would get anything for tonight's opportunity to repent. If you're in this room and you don't know God and God has been silent, friend, don't think he's thinking like you. If you think tomorrow you can get right, you're wrong. Tomorrow is a word only found in a fool's calendar. All you have is today. Today is a day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the acceptable time. Today is a day you have no tomorrow, friend. Today's the day. Devil will tell you, there's plenty of time. There's people that are being buried today all over the country that he told that to yesterday. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of time. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give this altar call. Every one of you that have sin in your life in this room right here, every one of you in the chapel that have sin in your life, every one of you in the choir room, in the cafeteria that have sin in your life, you have no choice tonight. You must move forward when charity begins to sing. You must get your heart right with God. See, tonight your desire would be, should be for God to break his silence to break his silence, for him to hear your cry at these altars. And from these altars, you lift your head towards the heavens, and suddenly they're open wide. As pastor says, the heavens are jacked open. And you look up, and he looks down, and the Son of God is radiating on you, and he's forgiving you, washing your sins away, and suddenly you're like you've always supposed to be in communion with your heavenly Father. That's why he created you, friend. Don't fall for this stuff. Don't fall for what the wicked are falling for. Just because he's not executing his wrath, everything must be okay. There's a ton of stuff I haven't talked about here, friend, but I'm going to give you a chance right now to get right with God. Everyone in this room that has sin in their life and in the other facilities, there's sin in your life. Every backslider in this room, you know you're doing things that normally you would never do. You've hidden something in your heart. God knows it. He has shined a halogen spotlight on it tonight. He sees it. You see it. You know God's nailing you. You do not stay in your pew. Do not stay in your seat. Do not stand in the balcony. You're going to come as quickly as you can and get your heart right with God. There's nothing like it, friend, under the sun. There's nothing like walking in fellowship with God. There's nothing like lifting up your hands and having a pure relationship with God. There's nothing like nothing in your heart between you and him. It's wonderful. It is wonderful to live with a pure conscience. It's wonderful to look at anybody and not have to think evil thoughts. It's wonderful, friend, to know you're right with God. So as Charity begins to sing tonight, everyone who's away from God, Buddhist, 
Jews, Muslims, New Agers, Eastern religions, this is for you. Jesus crucified, was crucified by God Almighty 2,000 years ago for you, friend. The cross, the blood, you've heard it all tonight, friend. See, the gospel's been shared about 14 times tonight. For those of you that are here waiting, waiting, wondering when the gospel's going to be shared, friend, you ain't been listening. You haven't been listening. Testimony after testimony, song after song. Then at the preacher at the end of his message, another time, the blood, the cross, that was for you. He was crucified for you. He bled for you. He died for you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Is your tarot card reader laying down his life for you? Is your new ager laying down his life for you? Do you call 1-900-PSYCHIC and they're laying their lives down for you? No, sir. Jesus died for you. He laid his life down for you. He was crucified on Calvary for you. He did it for you. I'm telling you what you got to do. He did it for you, friend. Now it's time for you to do something. You're going to have to step out. Why do I have to come down here, friend? Don't give me that snotty answer, friend. Don't give me that snotty response. That is snot straight from hell. That is pride. Yeah. Pride will damn your soul. Read it in the scripture. God abhors it. God disdains it. God rejects. He resists the proud, the Bible says. He turns his head from a proud man. You're saying by that, I'm going to stay in this pew. I can't go down there. What will my wife think? What will my friends think? Who cares what anybody thinks? What does God think, friend, tonight? What does God think? Right now, as charity begins to sing, everyone that's in sin, everyone that's away from God, everyone that needs forgiveness, everyone right here that wants Jesus to forgive them tonight, I want you to step out right now and hurry. Break God's silence tonight. Let's go. Get on your knees before the Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on, hurry, 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 God bless you. In the balcony, let's go. In the balcony, let's go. Come on, I need the Lord. 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 Workers, come join us. Workers, we need you now. Come on. This ain't a concert. If you want Jesus Christ to break his silence, if you want the Lord to forgive you and wash your sins away, if you want the relationship between him and you to be, to be open, wide open, step from your seat right now and get down here. What are you waiting on? Get down here right now. Get down here right now. Come on. Sir, God, speak into your heart. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. No music, no nothing. Just step out and come like a man. Step down and come like a woman. Step down. Why don't you stand up for the first time in your life? Confront sin for what it really is. It is sin and it damns your soul. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on. Come on. In the chapel, what are you waiting on? In the cafeteria, in the choir room, what are you waiting on? Step out. Quit looking around. Come forward. God's dealing with your heart. Get on your face before God tonight. Break the silence, God. Break the silence, God. Break your silence, God. Don't be silent towards me anymore, Father. I've tried to make this sound a different way, friend, by reading it this morning in so many different commentaries, so many different scriptures, but this is what it really says, friend. There's a wrath coming down. There is judgment coming down, friend. There's no way to cut it. 
There's no way to get around it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Those of you that feel the pain. God is pulling deep. He's going deep right now. He's going deep. There's somebody here, he's going back 18 years. There's someone else here, he's going back eight years. Someone else, he's going back nine days. You did something nine days ago. You think God didn't take notice? God saw it, friend. He saw everything you did. He knows everything. Get down here now. It won't work standing in the pew. You got to come down, friend. You got us to come down. Those of you at the altar, don't move. Stay right where you are. Keep your heads down. God's calling people. God bless you, sir. Be obedient. Be obedient. God bless you. Be obedient. Hurry. Hurry. God bless you, sir. I knew he was speaking to you, brother. Break his silence. Break his silence by stepping out, friend. God bless you, sir. Don't put up with the quiet anymore. You got to be in fellowship with him. Step out. Step out. Confess your sins before the Lord. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. God bless you, both of you. Church, do not rush us. Do not rush this part. If you rush this in your spirit, what you need to do is move into what God's doing. Move into what God's doing. You're going to meet some of these people in heaven because you gave them time. You gave them time and you're going to meet them in heaven because of it. Come on down. In the balcony, what are you waiting on? Get down here. God's dealing with you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. Get right, get right, get right tonight. God bless you, ma'am. Come on. Come on. God bless you, sir. This ain't condemnation, friend. This is love. You got it all mixed up. This is freedom. You're so confused about it, friend. This is freedom. This is wonderful. This is before the court date. This is before the judgment. This is when you can get your court docket cleared and stand before the judge, a free man. Now is the time. Come on. Come on. Come on.
God bless you. Friend, if you could see what we're seeing, you'd... It's awesome the way God is convicting. I can feel the convicting power of God just resting on people. God's doing some deep excavations, friend. Don't come halfway around the world to this revival and leave out dirty. Leave out clean, friend. Leave out clean. Leave out clean. God bless you. Yes, come on. Oh, there's going to be another wave right now. I want you to come. Step out right now. Step out right now. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. Come on right now. Come on right now. That's the love of God. I see it, brother. God bless you. God bless you, sis. Come on. Come on. In the chapel, come on. In the cafeteria, don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. God bless you, sis. God bless you, sir. Come on. Okay, that's it. I want everyone at the altar, close your eyes. Bow your heads, everyone in the chapel. Close your eyes. Everyone at the altar at the chapel, everyone at the altar at the cafeteria in the choir room. I want to shut your eyes. The altar call is closed. The altar call is closed. For those of you that wanted to come forward, I'm going to let you know something, friend. You're playing with fire. You're going to learn something about obeying God. Some of you are going to spend a most miserable night tonight because you're not obeying God. Everyone at this altar, I want you to pray out loud with me right now. We're going to have the Lord forgive us to wash us clean right now. No, we're not. Rusty with us. The door just swung open, friend. I'm telling you, if you're planning on coming forward, I want you to tap off. 60 seconds, brother. Do them slow. 60 seconds like this. He's going to tap off 60 seconds on the drum. You have 60 seconds to come down here to this altar. The door is swung open. If you know you need to repent of your sins, you come now and now alone. This is the time for you. Start it right now, brother. 60 seconds. Let's go. You need forgiveness. What are you waiting on? God bless you. God bless you. Come on down. God bless you. 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 God bless you, sir. That's 20 seconds. You're wasting time. You're doing it again, friend. You're wasting time. Step out. Step out. God bless you. God bless you. That's 32 seconds. Let's go. Let's go. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. That's 40 seconds. God bless you. God bless you. In the chapel, in the cafeteria, time is running out. Tell me when we're at 10. Four, three, two, one.
That scares me to death, friend. We just had 50 more people come down to this altar, some of them wailing. That scares me, friend. How you can wait so long. When you hear God's voice, Pastor, Lord is saying to some of us in the ministry that he has called you here and that you're hoping to come and get some oil for the mechanics of your ministry and you're hoping to get the machinery of your ministry all greased up where you can go back home and things will be better for you. But the Lord says to some of you in the ministry in this building and other buildings on this campus, it's not going to work like that, friend. The only thing that's going to work is whenever you get your heart where it ought to be with God. You've got to return to that place of a relationship between you and Jesus. Forget the church. Forget about your programs. Forget about all the things in regard to the church. It's now it's you and the Lord. God's talking to you. And you're about to leave this place because tomorrow this conference is over. Many of you are going to fly out tomorrow. You won't even be here tomorrow night. Many of you won't even be here Saturday. And what you came for, hoping to get, it doesn't work like that, and you're not going to get what you came for because God's calling you. Listen to the Lord. That's a word from the Lord, friend. I want everyone at the altar to pray with me. I want you to pray out loud. Every one of you in the chapel that have come forward, I want you to pray out loud with me right now. There's somebody else about to step out. As a matter of fact, this individual that's about to step out, you just said to God, if you're seriously about this, God, if you're really trying to speak to me, have the evangelist call me out. Have him give me one more chance. And that's exactly what I'm doing. God heard you, but friend, God is opening up the heavens for you right now. He is lifting up his voice. He is speaking, but his silence will come over you like a blanket in a minute if you do not respond. Step out right now, friend. Step out right now. Step out right now. Step out right now. In the chapel, in the cafeteria, the choir room. Step out right now. Give me one more chance, Jesus. He's trying. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's somebody in this room. I can feel it right now, friend. We've been at this a while, friend. I know what the Spirit of God's doing in this place. There's somebody. He won't release me. He's not releasing me. There's someone by the name of Margie that needs to come down here. God bless y'all. God bless you. Yeah, come on. Come on. God bless you for responding. Come on. Okay, we're going to pray. This time we are going to pray. Los que están acá que hablan español, vamos a orar juntos. We're going to pray together. I want every one of you at the altar to pray this prayer with me. It makes absolutely no difference what class citizen you are, where you're from, who people think you are, what your rank in society is, whether you're from the dirt, poor streets, or from Wall Street, friend, we're all the same. Whether you've known the Lord all your life and there's, you're coming back to Him with a sin, or you've never known God, everybody's going to pray this prayer at these altars. Pray it out loud, everyone now. Dear Jesus, thank you for breaking your silence. Thank you for not leaving me alone. I ask you tonight to change me. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Jesus, that by the blood I receive forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, that tonight you will wash my sins away. Tonight I repent. I repent of my sins. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me clean. I ask you tonight 
to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. I give myself 100% to you. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. In your precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord.